Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of What's on My Desk. Well, what should I say on my buddy Steve Halleck's desk? Today is going to be something a little bit different. Uh, so rather than showing you my desk and a bunch of watches, which you see I don't have any here, I'm actually reaching out to my friend Steve Halleck of TikToking.com. You guys always ask me to talk about independent, independent watchmakers, independent watch companies, and so on and so forth. And though, though I do have a fairly good knowledge in regards to independent watchmakers, the watches that they make, and I'm absolutely infatuated with some of the stuff that's out there for some of the brands that we're going to discuss in this episode. Before I get into asking Steve a question, uh, I am going to tell you a little bit about Steve. Steve's story is actually pretty similar to mine. He started in a tech background. He then helped for years run one of the most successful watch forums out there. The most notable thing about Steve is Steve is the guy that actually started MBNF North America. And he ran MBNF North America for seven years, contributing to a lot of the success that company has had year to date. This guy's been featured in numerous magazines like Esquire, Forbes, Work Magazine, White Wall. Uh, he was a frequent uh, contributor to online publications such as Wikipedia, TechCrunch, etc., etc. After a while, Steve has decided to go out for himself, share his passion for collecting watches, weird, different, intricate, out of this world watches because of the realm that he was always in and he sort of stuck with those independents and uh, he's been doing it for quite a while now and he's been very successful at it. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask Steve uh, perhaps three questions about three brands that probably are the forerunners of all independents out there today. Uh, you guys I'm sure are very familiar with those brands. I've spoken about these brands on my episode. I've shown these watches and I'm just gonna let Steve tell you about these brands. And the first I'm gonna ask Steve to talk to me about Urbic, probably one of my favorite indie brands. So Steve, tell me a little bit about Urbic. Show me an Urbic watch, tell me what's so special about. I know you're a great nuts and bolt reviewer and unfortunately my show is not about that, but I will link your channel below and you guys can check out Steve's hands on reviews. They're really nuts and bolts, they're really detailed and they really truly give you a lot of information. I watch those videos in order to gain more knowledge on the nuts and bolts on a lot of these things. So Steve, tell me what you think about Urbic, please. Wow, all right, Roman, thank you for the extremely generous introduction. I'm super excited to share my passion with you guys. I love independent watchmaking. This is the part of the industry that really uh, jazzes me up. I think it's the coolest, most creative, most innovative, highest quality uh, stuff that's going on and really uh, deserves a lot of our attention. So. Man, I've spent the last more than a decade of my life looking at these things. I'm glad you asked me about Urwork too, because Urwork is a truly foundational brand within this world, and it's a great place to start. Now, you have to imagine that the rise of independent watchmaking kind of comes with the rise of the internet. So the internet makes it possible for a young Felix Baumgartner, who is the master watchmaker that is the uh, driving force behind Urwerk to be able to create his own watch and actually reach potential customers around the world. This wasn't possible before then. Um, and so you really have this starting in the late 1990s and picking up steam in the early 2000s. And Urwerk was at the very, very, very beginning of this. So uh, the piece that really broke through and was the, uh, kind of one of the absolute most influential foundational pieces of this whole movement is the Urwerk 103. And I have a version of those to show you today. So let's uh, take a look at that one. All right, so the original version of this watch came out in like 2000, almost 20 years ago, right? And this just blew people away. Nobody had ever seen something quite like this. And you know, in the 70s, people had made, uh, some of the big brands even, had made watches in kind of crazy cases, but never on the very, very high end. And that's one of the cool things that Felix brought is uh, what happens when a master watchmaker makes uh, extremely high end, high finished uh, movements, cases, uh, mechanisms, and yet 
uses a design language that is really of the now and not referencing the past. Uh, so you have this very sci-fi look. On the back, you have what they call a control board. Here you have a power reserve, seconds hand. Uh, it's a manual wine watch with this big, cool crown. Uh, and Urwerk is famous for these wandering hour displays. So here you have these four discs that rotate as they go under here, and they show the hours and they sweep across the minutes, almost like a sundial. So there you have three, 315, 330, and as the three goes past the 60, the four goes down to be four o'clock, and that's how you tell time. It's actually quite easy to tell time on once you get used to it, you know? Let me show you on the wrist. Now the cool thing about any of these like artistic movements is that uh, one person ends up really influencing another. So if you talk to a Max Buser or something like that, um, you're gonna find that when they first saw the Urwerk 103, that this was kind of a seminal moment for them when they realized what could be done in this world of independent watchmaking. And so there you have the Urwerk 103. Now when these came out, I think they were about $50,000 to start. Um, this version, which is the 103.08, which gives you this really cool uh, titanium, aluminum nitride, I think they call it, finish, which is this uh, extremely hard coating on a steel that's this cool kind of brownish purple color. Uh, this is one of the most desirable versions and these are about $32,000 or so today. Um, so not, not too bad given the original 50 some thousand retail, but also I think they're, they're kind of slept on for now because this is a very, very important watch uh, in terms of modern watchmaking. So that's the 103.08 from Urwerk, their first big hit. And you know, this is where Urwerk really broke through. Well, answers my question. Definitely a great insight, Stephen. Thank you for that. My next question to you is going to be in regards to Grubel Forze. Now, Grubel Forze is a high-end, very expensive independent watch uh, brand in line with all the big boys. So I'm hoping you can show me one of the Grubels you may have in stock. Again, tell me a little bit about the brand and tell me about the resale value on them, both new and used. Ah, uh, okay, so we're gonna bring out the heavy hitters here. Grubel Forsey. Man, Grubel's like the tip, 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 top pinnacle of the mountain, right? When you've seen it all and you want the best, that's Grubel. So the idea behind Grubel Forsey was, what happens if we take the best mechanics, you know, they do a ton of research and development to find out what kind of mechanisms present the best timekeeping. Um, in the beginning, they were mainly focused on the tourbillon and, you know, fun fact, their uh, double tourbillon 30 degree technique actually is the most accurate um, watch on record at an observatory trial a few years ago. Um, but so they do all this research and then the idea is what happens then if we make it with uh, quality and manufacturing and finish that the world has never seen in any product before. Um, and that's where you get Grubel Forsey, right? So they have over a hundred employees. They make fewer than a hundred watches a year. And I think what people don't realize is that as you kind of push the boundaries of what can be done and go towards that level of perfection that can never be reached, each tiny little step is exponentially more difficult and of course, unfortunately, more expensive. Grubel does that, you know? So to get from the 98th percentile of perfection that most of us would be thrilled to own or to ever even see in our life, I mean, you're talking like Patek Philippe minute repeaters and, and the most amazing stuff that there is. And then Grubel's idea is, well, what happens if we push that even the tiniest little bit further? and that creates some extreme challenges that really only an independent brand could answer because you can't create anything in the types of quantities that a big brand would need um, and still have that level of quality. So uh, today I have a Grubel 4C GMT to show you guys and let's dig into it. All right, here's the big dog, the Grubel GMT. And you can see down here, you've got a tourbillon. Now Grubel did research and found that the best way to make a single tourbillon is actually to put it at a certain uh, angle. So it's not vertical. 
and also to have it rotate once every 24 seconds instead of uh, traditional tourbillon, which is once every 60 seconds. Um, so it's going extremely fast, basically, um, and that presents all of its own engineering challenges. Uh, here you can see the tremendous three-dimensional globe that gives you the time all around the world, GMT hand, your time telling, power reserve, small seconds, uh, but really with Grubel, you need to see this extreme finish. So you've got this black polish on this bridge here and this depth. And on the back again, these beautiful frosted bridges, bevels, blued screws. Here you have a world timer that gives you summer and winter time in uh, all of the big cities around the world. So I often say that a uh, seeing a Grubel 4C for the first time is like when you see an HD television after seeing SD forever. You know, I think we all kind of remember that. And just the, the precision of the finish of each thing uh, makes each little piece jump out in a way that doesn't happen on any other watch. You know, this really is the absolute best of the best in terms of uh, watchmaking on planet Earth. So let me show you this one on my wrist. Now, unfortunately, the best of the best of watchmaking on planet Earth doesn't come cheap. This watch is, I think, 610,000, I may be a little bit off, 600 and something retail, um, and I sell these for about 300 grand. You gotta pay to play, but for your money, you're really getting the tip, tip top of, uh, of what you can get. And in fact, uh, for a lot of the Grubles that I've sold, um, I take in a lot of trades on these. You know, it happens a lot that people are sitting with several watches that are maybe a little bit lesser tier and they realize that this is the top tier. And, um, and so maybe they'll trade in three or four uh, other watches to get one truly, truly great watch. So that's the Grubel GMT. You know what, Steve? I actually knew that you had a, uh, the GMT in stock, and I was hoping that was going to be the one you're going to pick for this episode, and I'm glad you did. I actually did an episode with one of those watches in stock. Of course, I didn't do as good a job describing it as you did, but this is a hell of a watch, and hands down, this is indeed my favorite Grubel Forze. I'm going to ask Steve one more, and as usual, I saved the best for last, and the reason for that is because Steve, I'm sure, is going to be biased because I'm going to ask him to talk about MBNF. And again, I briefly touched upon MBNF in one of my previous episodes. I'll put the link up here somewhere. And uh, I want to get your take on it. Having had your feet on the ground with MBNF, them starting from scratch here in North America to where the brand is today. Again, tell me your thoughts on the brand. And again, we don't mind you being biased. Everybody knows I love APs and I'm always biased towards APs whenever I do this. So feel free to be as biased as possible. But do tell us about MBNF. And I know you happen to have a very special HM3, AKA the Frog in stock. So I'm hoping you can show us that and tell us a little bit about that. That was a super limited project that I think you personally did with Max. I would love to see that watch and hear you talk about it. And again, don't forget, talk to me in terms of resale value, current market conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Ah, yes, MBNF, near and dear to my heart. You know, I've known Max Buser, the MB of MBNF, for now about 15 years. And uh, MBNF stands for Max Buser and Friends, for those of you who don't know. Max was the head of Harry Winston timepieces, and he created the Opus series, which really put a bunch of these independent watchmakers on the map. Um, and after Opus 5, which he did with Felix Baumgartner of Erwerk, he left to create his own little brand. Um, and as he was creating it, he, he and I had a coffee together and he was saying, Steve, you know, I don't know what to do in the United States, uh, North America. I don't know any of the retailers. I don't know the media. I don't know anything. Uh, and I said, you know what, I'll do it. This seems like a really cool thing that you're doing and I would love to be involved. And uh, it was a really exciting thing to be a part of. And so it'll always be important to me. And today I have actually a really important piece from my time there. Uh, I have the HM3 Chocolate Frog. Uh, and let's, uh, let's dig into that one and we'll see what we've got. Okay, cool, Chocolate Frog. So this was a big project of mine when I was with MBNF. 
Uh, first of all, we have the HM3, which means horological machine. And the idea with the horological machines is to take the best of the best of traditional watchmaking. Um, so these are all made with, you know, just steel and brass and, uh, you know, traditional mechanisms and stuff, but then to kind of rearrange the parts into a crazy mechanical sculpture. And HM3 puts the rotor on the top, so you have a lot of movement uh, all the time on your wrist. Uh, and the frog version introduced these two sapphire domes, which really pushed the limits of sapphire manufacturing at the time. Uh, and I'll show you how you tell time with this. The, these are aluminum domes inside the sapphire domes, and they turn, so you read hours and minutes. Now this piece in particular, the chocolate frog, was actually uh, my, uh, my baby when I was with MBNF. I noticed that uh, a lot of times, at the time forums were huge and I had come from the forum world. There was a forum called the Purists where I learned a lot of my independent knowledge. And the Purists turned into Purist Pro where they were trying to um, be a little bit more commercial. And I ended up actually uh, on an executive staff role uh, with them for a little bit before I joined MBNF, but they were, you know, close to my heart. And a lot of times I saw that uh, we would find customers on these forums and then those guys would have to walk into a retailer and buy the watch. So I had this idea, what if an online platform could just sell watches, right? Um, and the purists had a 10th anniversary and my idea was what if we made a 10 piece limited edition for them that they sold directly through their platform. And nobody knew if an online forum could sell a, at the time I believe this was $76,000 if I remember right. Um, so we didn't know if a, a forum could sell a $76,000 watch. So um, I vividly remember when the first one sold, uh, they ended up selling and selling well and quickly and uh, I was sort of jumping for joy. But this kind of uh, was the precursor to what you see now with like Hodinkee uh, and that sort of thing, selling directly on these media platforms. Uh, so uh, this was kind of an important piece uh, in terms of the uh, history of uh, horology and online sales and in my personal history as well. Now these sell today for about $52,000. Uh, so uh, this limited edition has kind of held its value pretty well, and I think also it's, it's just one of the coolest versions. Let me show you on my wrist. There's nothing like an MBNF on the wrist, you know. All right, there's the MBNF HM3 Chocolate Frog. Okay, so now I want that watch, Steve. Call me later, we'll discuss. What a kick-ass watch and what a kick-ass company. Steven, thank you for the insight on MBNF. In closing, I would just like to ask you one more question. For those guys out there that probably just caught the biggest independent watchmaker bug by watching your video, or our video, I should say, what is the one advice you can give to a collector that wants to get into collecting these watches from independent watchmakers? Okay, cool, I'm glad you asked me that. Uh, there's two main things that come to mind. The first is that this is an area where, you know, Roman says it, everybody says, buy what you love, right? But this is an area where that's especially true. You have to uh, make sure that you truly trust your own taste uh, and be willing to kind of go out on a limb because if you buy something like an MBNF, you're gonna get it home, your wife's gonna think you're crazy, your friends are gonna think you were crazy. Uh, it's not gonna immediately get you 100,000 Instagram followers. Um, this is sort of stuff for people who don't care what other people think necessarily. Um, and I think that ultimately that's gonna prove to be a real positive in the long run. You know, this area, when you, when you buy the right pieces from the right brands, it doesn't tend to follow that same boom and bust uh, structure that a lot of these other brands do. Uh, there hasn't been so much of the crazy heat poured into these things. Um, and so uh, you can buy really important foundational pieces that are actually like important in the history of horology uh, and they're around and they're, um, you know, fairly accessible given their original prices. And if you are somebody who's comfortable knowing that you have refined your taste over the years uh, to the point where you can really trust yourself and buy what you love 
and be cool with it, then this is a really great area for you. Um, and the number two thing is to find people in the area that you trust. This is a big reason why I make my YouTube videos. You know, these brands are tiny. They don't have the kinds of marketing budgets that the big brands have. And so it's a lot harder to find information about these things. So I try to make my videos and just give general information on the brands and the pieces because in order, you know, the first thing I said is buy what you love, but in order to love a thing, you have to know that it exists um, and you have to have some idea of what there is to love about it, right? Um, and so that's, uh, I'm always trying to do education, whether it's on my YouTube or in my Instagram. Um, there are a couple other dealers that do play in this space. You know, Rowan was very humble in his introduction, but he, he does do quite a bit in this independent world and he knows a lot more than most. And if he doesn't know, he'll reach out to somebody like me. And so I'm sure he can answer a lot of your questions. Um, but yeah, there, there is data and um, history to be found here and you should do your research and you should find out uh, which of these are important and which are, you know, there are some brands that came and went and um, things that kind of look cool the first time you see them, but they don't really have the substance behind them. Um, so this is why I try to really curate the pieces that I uh, am involved with and, and buy basically, uh, based on the stuff I think is important. And there are other people out there too that uh, can guide you in those ways. So anyway, thank you very, very much to Roman. Uh, thank you to you guys. I'm really happy that I got to show you uh, what's on my desk and I hope to do this again in the future. Bye-bye. Well, okay, thanks, Steve. Guys, I'm gonna link all of Steve's information below his website. He also has a YouTube channel. He actually has more subscribers than me, uh, and I'll link that below. Go check him out. Hit the subscribe button on his channel as well. You won't regret it. Probably one of the best technical reviewers on YouTube, period. Again, I myself go to his YouTube channel oftentimes when I wanna get into the nuts and bolts about a particular watch or a complex watch that I don't know much about. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. I'm going to start doing a lot more of these because I'm sure you guys are tired of looking at the same mug every single week. Guys, comment below and let me know what you think about me collabing with different people in the industry. If there are any suggestions that you may have for the format of these videos or who I should do a collab with, by all means, reach out to me. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you're already not subscribed to my channel. And I'll see you guys next week for more watch reviews and other videos.